So welcome everyone to tonight's panel, Housing Policy is Climate Policy as part of Arlington's Eco Week or Eco Weeks as it were. Um, tonight we will draw connections between the important themes of housing access and choice, greenhouse gas reduction and climate resilience, public health and more. And my name is Talia Fox. I am the Sustainability Manager for the Town of Arlington. Thank you for tuning in. We will be recording tonight's panel and posting slides in the coming days. And we invite you to share questions in the Q&A function in your Zoom platform during the webinar. We will do our best to answer those questions either in written form or verbally during our public question and answer session. And we thank you for your patience as we try to address all your questions. So we'll begin tonight with a brief introduction to planning for housing and climate in Arlington from myself and the Director of Planning and Community Development, Jennifer Raitt. I'll then hand it over to Brucey Moulton, co-chair of Sustainable Arlington, to introduce everyone to our amazing panelists. And then we'll hear some presentations from those panelists, and we'll have some time finally for a moderated question and answer session, making sure to get everyone out into the beautiful evening um, by 8.30, if not a bit beforehand. So with that, um, I'll hand it over to Jenny, and uh, Jenny will kick us off with an overview of how we approach planning and housing, uh, planning around housing and climate here in Arlington. Thanks, Jenny. Thank you, Talia. Um, you're going to advance the slides, yes. Great, so thank you everybody for attending this evening. As Talia said, I'm Jenny Raid. I'm the Director of Planning and Community Development for the town. And I'm gonna talk about the intersection of housing and climate, um, what we're doing here in Arlington. So next slide, please. So what is Arlington's approach? We have a lot of approaches when it comes to climate change and resiliency and adaptation. Um, there are two primary goals that we follow when it comes to thinking about those two, two issues. The first one is about reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Those are the pollutants that cause climate change. And the second is to adapt to and mitigate to, and to mitigate climate change impacts, which means that we need to change the way we do things and sometimes modify um, sort of some of the existing conditions. The housing approach that we've taken is about enhancing the availability and the affordability of housing throughout the community and to eliminate structural barriers to housing choice. We see these two areas of um, practice in climate resiliency and adaptation and housing as having quite an intersection in how we approach our work in the community. And we're always thinking about ways to bring in different um, uh, committees and boards and commissions who are working on both housing as well as climate topics in the community, which is why we wanted to work in collaboration with Sustainable Arlington on this particular event. Next slide. And we have a number of plans that are part of the sort of force behind the work that we do. It actually, it's not listed here, but um, Sustainable Arlington created a sustainable plan for Arlington many decades ago and was really the a wonderful plan that much of it was implemented and including a reduction in green, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, more recently, though, we adopted a net zero action plan for the community based upon the goals set by the select board to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and to become net zero by 2050. And with that in mind, it meant that other planning initiatives needed to follow that suit. So the next one is Connect Arlington. And that is our sustainable transportation plan, which is about uh, equity and multimodal opportunities in the community for access. And it's really about centering equity and creating options for people to get in and around Arlington, but also beyond Arlington. So focusing not just on, uh, uh, of course, vehicles, we wanna have vehicle reduction, vehicle miles traveled reduced, but also thinking about transit opportunities like bus access um, and access to the T. Um, and then also bike facilities and pedestrian facilities to make things more comfortable for people to get around Arlington. Um, and then the last two plans have an intersection about affordable housing and fair housing. The fair housing action plan is really a, a plan that sets forth uh, equity and centers fairness in all of our practices, not just housing, but an access to housing choice, but also in where we're locating housing and opportunities for people to access other amenities in our community. The housing production plan, which was recently fully adopted by the select board and redevelopment board, 
also has a number of policies that are really key to centering both housing and access to opportunities in the community. Next slide. And these key plans are the roadmaps. So the first of them, as I mentioned, the, the net zero action plan, that's the roadmap to reduce our greenhouse gas emission. Connect Arlington, the strategy is to provide safe, reliable multimodal transportation network that meets the needs of all people of all ages and abilities. And the Fair Housing Action Plan, bringing all of this together with actions to achieve equitable access to housing choice and to eliminate housing discrimination and re residential segregation. And lastly, the housing plan, which provides us with a whole suite of strategies to increase both the supply of affordable housing in all neighborhoods and more broadly look at the housing opportunities in the community. And now I'm going to hand it over to you, Talia, so that you can walk us through talking about some of those layers of how these plans intersect. Thank you. Thanks, Jenny. So a key goal of the webinar today is to draw connections in the areas of housing and climate. And so the plans that Jenny just introduced work together to promote shared themes as she was starting to get at, including equity and environmental justice, mobility, affordability, efficiency, increased choice, and public health, as well as resilience. And I'll speak to just a few of these themes as they appear in Arlington's plans. So we know that climate change disproportionately impacts communities of color and low-income community, low communities, and that the quality uh, and location of housing are environmental justice issues. So the development of all four of these plans and the actions in them centered equity and environmental justice. For example, the Fair Housing Action Plan is rooted in the concept of affirmatively furthering fair housing, which um, per the Department of Housing and Urban Development uh, means taking steps proactively to address significant disparities in access to community assets. So this connects to issues of access to healthy environments, food, essential services, and transportation options. And related to this last point about transportation options, all four plans promote mobility and accessibility, the ability for residents and visitors of all needs to get where they need to go, using forms of transportation that are reliable and safe, affordable and convenient. The housing production plan in particular has a key strategy of targeting new housing to areas that can take advantage of transit, walking and biking. And this uh, takes this strategy works in tandem with the other plan strategies to reduce reliance on private vehicles by providing more options to carpool, bike, walk, and take transit. And that makes it possible to choose uh, and, and making it possible to choose housing in locations that have these options. That's really critical. And the way that we make it possible for people to choose housing options um, and housing that is accessible that has a variety of transportation options is by making it more affordable. So many residents in Arlington face high housing costs. And when you add transportation costs on that and then energy costs on top of that, it really adds up as we all know. And as the Connect Arlington plan notes, not every individual or household wants to or can afford to own a car or more than one car. And at the same time, we really have to be mindful of ensuring that more affordable alternative forms of transportation, which are often the ones that use less energy, right, and emit less pollution, are convenient and accessible for people. So these plans all work to address uh, all these intersecting issues that impact affordability. And finally, um, again, this is not, these are not the only themes uh, intersecting these plans, but I'll, this is the last one I'll speak to. But if we figure out how to use less energy, drive alone less, we can probably save money. As the Net Zero Action Plan notes, making homes and buildings super efficient will help us reduce emissions and make energy bills more affordable. And all of the plans here work to do more with the resources that we already have. For example, getting folks to use public transit that exists and reduce existing, reuse existing materials in buildings promote affordability, accessibility, and mobility at the same time. So with that, I will turn it back over to Jenny to close out our introductory portion here and then hand it over to Brucey to kick off our panel. Thank you, and a very quick summary before I hand it over to Brucey is just to, 
So thank you, Talia, for walking us through the shared themes. There's much more that we'll discuss um, along the way after we hear from our other panelists. And um, just looking forward to illustrating for residents in the community and others who are listening, um, just how much intersection there is between housing policy and climate policy. And we're gonna hear a lot of examples of that as we get into this program tonight. So thank you. Um, Brucey? Oh, can't hear you yet. Thank you, Jenny, and good evening. It's my pleasure to be here with you tonight as the moderator and as co-chair of Sustainable Arlington and a longtime resident of our town. I wanna to say a few words first about the relationship between housing and climate change. One home by itself doesn't have much to do with climate change. All of our homes together do. How we locate, design, build, maintain, and operate our homes are all factors that relate to increased global warming. The climate crisis is here, not off in some distant future. And we are feeling its effects here, not only reading about them happening in some distant place. And that means that many things and ways of doing that we have taken for granted no longer serve us well. And that includes things that we have done about housing for a long, long time. It applies to housing, transportation, and other forms of resource consumption. But there is still good news. We know how to do better, as we will hear from tonight's panelists. We can reduce housing impacts on climate while also improving housing affordability and access. And the future will not look exactly like the past. We know that if there will be changes, we have to make them. By exploring the options and working together, we have good opportunities to achieve better outcomes. Jenny mentioned um, something about Sustainable Arlington's role in the town over the last oh, 20 plus years. Uh, in addition to helping to develop the first um, Arlington Sustainable, first and only to date, Arlington Sustainable Action Plan. We also ran the Solarize Arlington program in 2012, 157 contracts signed and solar panels installed. That was a start. We participated in and helped run um, Heat Smart 2019 collaboration between Arlington and the town of Winchester with many installations of air source heat pumps solar hot water, and even some ground source heat pumps for individual homes. We take a serious approach to education. We want to share what we learn about resource use, efficiency, new forms of, of heating and cooling, and renewable energy with other Arlington residents. We have done that through EcoFest, which used to be an annual event at Town Hall pre-COVID and has now morphed into a new program, Eco Week, of which this is part. Um, and we do it through collaboration with Arlington Community Education, which has been a very fruitful approach, wonderful way to reach more members of the community and have more voices heard. So let's start learning together this evening. I want to briefly introduce the panel to you. We're very fortunate to have our four guests. We have Emily Jones, Senior Program Officer with Local Initiatives Support Corporation. And that word support is key to what she does. She works to bring together experts to provide relevant trainings to support owners, property managers, and other stakeholders to help them complete 
energy efficiency, and clean energy projects. And focusing in particular on affordable housing sectors. Also, Warren Bauman, Vice President at New Ecology. Lauren has 15 years plus experience in providing green building and building science advisory services. And that building science term is critical because buildings are very particular combinations of structure and mechanical systems and local environmental um, conditions and building science can help us design new buildings and retrofit existing buildings to be as efficient in terms of resource use as possible. Next, I'd like to mention Zoe Weinlow, Director of Real Estate Development for Two Life Communities. Zoe brings over 20 years of experience in the field of affordable housing finance and development. And she has overseen completed projects totaling over $100 million in development costs, plus current projects in development worth over 150 million and other potential projects coming up. Finally, Michelle Epigian, Associate Principal of Icon Architecture. Michelle is an architect, planner, and urban designer who works to design a sustainable environments that strengthen communities and celebrate the uniqueness of place. I am particularly interested in her work on the first Passive House certified multifamily project in Massachusetts, which as I understand is the one nearby in Cambridge on Concord Avenue. I look forward to hearing their presentations tonight. They have a lot to tell us about what's possible, not only in Arlington, but communities everywhere and they bring a very hopeful message. And with that, I would like to turn it over to our speakers. Our first speaker tonight will be, our first pair of speakers tonight will be Emily Jones and Lauren Bauman. Thanks so much, Brucey, and thanks everyone to, for having us here this evening. Uh, so, so I was asked to kick off the conversation here tonight about housing and decarbonization and climate change to talk a little bit about the landscape that we see as it relates to what's driving uh, housing decarbonization. Um, as a little bit more background, the, the work that we do in building science uh, really focuses very specifically on high performance multifamily housing uh, and specifically affordable housing. And so, so we're working with developers and owners of multifamily housing uh, across the state uh, to help them design and build as well as retrofit high performance projects. And so, you know, we've really seen a, a, a bit of a, a revolution over the last uh, few years in terms Terms of the performance thresholds and standards that these developments are pursuing and achieving. Uh, and so I wanted to talk a little bit about what we see as driving those changes currently, as well as uh, things that we see that are potentially going to be driving changes in the future as well. Um, so to start that conversation, I wanted to talk a little bit about the state level work that's happening. Um, so while, while local municipalities definitely led the charge in Massachusetts as it relates to setting uh, emissions targets and goals, specifically the net zero goals around 2050 thresholds, um, what we've seen over the last year is, is Massachusetts, the Commonwealth kind of catch up with that. Uh, so folks are probably familiar with the legislation that was passed a little over a year ago essentially mandating that the Commonwealth meet net zero emissions by 2050. And what we've seen in the time since then is the Commonwealth really kind of organizing and starting its planning process around developing a clean energy and climate plan 
that will provide policy direction around how the Commonwealth as a whole will get to those emissions thresholds. Uh, and obviously that is gonna include activities and actions that are gonna happen uh, at, at all levels, the local level as well at the state. So I think that's one thing to keep an eye on right now. We expect to see more information coming out of the Commonwealth in July around that clean energy climate plan and sublimits around emissions thresholds for 2030 and 2050. Um, so, so lots of good things start starting to percolate at, at the state level that will, will likely be driving more and more energy, attention, and incentives and resources towards decarbonizing residential housing. A parallel uh, process that's currently going on at the state level with the Department of Energy Resources is an update to our energy codes, both residential and commercial. So DOER is currently pulling together new code language uh, that will complement upgrades that are being made right now to the base energy code by providing an updated stretch energy code, uh, which would be automatically promulgated in all communities that are currently members uh, that have opted into the stretch code. So, um, you know, that, that would be something that would come into effect locally uh, in the next year or so. Um, and then in addition to that, the climate legislation has mandated that DOER develop what's being called an opt-in municipal net zero energy code. And so this is a code that municipalities can actually opt into that will be more aggressive than the updated stretch energy code. And so yet another thing that will, will definitely have significant impact uh, at the local level around uh, housing decarbonization within the specific realm of new construction projects. Um, the other place where we've seen a lot of momentum recently has been uh, specifically as it relates to incentives driving housing decarbonization. So affordable housing has really been leading the charge from this perspective. Much of that subsidized affordable housing utilizes low income housing tax credits that are awarded by the state. And we've been seeing the, the essentially the requirements and or um, competitive advantage that the state provides to applications that commit to high performance housing really ratchet up over the last few years with references and points available now to projects that are committing to passive house. And so while a couple of years ago, we only had a few passive house multifamily projects in the works at New Ecology, we now have over 30 multifamily affordable passive house projects that are committing to pursuing passive house certification. And so multifamily affordable housing is by far leading the charge from this perspective. Um, we're also going to see some updates and changes to the Mass Safe program over the next uh, year or so. Uh, there is a new year, new three-year plan that's going into effect, and that, in combination with the emissions thresholds that have been committed to at the state level, are really going to require that the state take a hard look at the Mass Safe program and really try and align that uh, with the emissions reduction that needs to happen to meet uh, the 2030 and 2050 requirements. And so. We anticipate to see some changes in the Mass Safe program that are going to really incentivize electrification, high performance buildings on the new construction side, and also provide resources uh, to existing buildings that are looking to um, reduce emissions as well through weatherization as well as electrification. Um, as we mentioned, a lot has been happening at the local level. Um, you know, we've seen Boston and Cambridge really being leaders around. Uh, utilizing zoning to, to push projects further than perhaps they would go on their own as it relates to performance. And so good examples of that include Article 37 in Boston, which requires compliance with green building rating system certification levels. Um, we're seeing that updated to include carbon emissions thresholds and targets. Uh, and so, so really seeing these zoning uh, ordinances that have been around for a little while now really uh, upgrade to align with emissions reduction uh, and really focus on those issues. Uh, the same is true as it relates to the existing building stock, uh, residential building stock. So any buildings over a certain size in both Boston and Cambridge are required to report on their energy use, um, but we're seeing both of those municipalities really extending the impact of those programs in order to move towards having required emissions reductions over time between now and 2050 uh, to, to get the existing building stock to where it needs to be to hit our emissions thresholds and requirements. 
And last but not least, we've seen grassroots advocacy really being a driver around residential decarbonization. Uh, in communities such as Newton, we've seen uh, local grassroots organizations utilizing the special permit process uh, for development to really encourage developers to make commitments that might be even more significant than what's required by zoning or other energy code requirements. Um, in order to get their developments uh, to be realized. And so those types of grassroots advocacy efforts are, are critically important. So we see sort of the, the top down as well as the bottom up sort of pressures on these issues. Uh, in terms of what we were looking forward to in the future, I mentioned, you know, seeing sort of the state regulations that get promulgated and the policy framework for those. Um, one of the things I want to make sure we talk a little bit about today is that most of what I've discussed so far really relates specifically to the operating energy use of residential buildings. Um, but it's critically important that we think not only about the operating energy use of residential buildings, but also what's called the embodied carbon impact. And so that is the amount of energy and the associated emissions pollution that come from producing, transporting, uh, materials for projects. Um, so there's there's a very important need to be acknowledging the carbon emissions that come from those materials when we think about our climate issues and making sure that we're very cognizant of those things when we're building new construction buildings and we're making good materials choices as it relates to materials, especially on the structural side that are low emissions, really trying to reduce steel and concrete, which are very high emissions materials in favor of other types of materials like um, mass timber. Um, but then also thinking about embodied carbon as it relates to existing buildings. Um, existing buildings have already spent their embodied carbon with the materials that are currently in place. So being very thoughtful about how we retrofit existing buildings to really leverage the materials that are currently in place while improving the performance of those buildings through strategic implementation of low carbon materials. So with that, I'll turn it over to Emily. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, this is that was great. And so uh, continuing on, as Lauren spoke to what is driving the housing decarbonization, I want to speak a little bit more about uh, now how we actually decarbonize buildings in an equitable manner. So uh, we're, I think the first thing we need to acknowledge is that there are very real transition barriers particularly for low and moderate income households, as well as owners of affordable housing who are already working to build and preserve affordable housing on very limited or stretched subsidies. So we see the, the equitable decarbonization in sort of three main pillars. Um, and the first is supporting that upfront cost to, de to decarbonize the building, right? So that can range from pre-energy work, uh, there might be electrical upgrades that are needed, safety upgrades, asbestos remediation, things like that, to even be able to move forward with a building upgrade. Uh, and, and just for, for folks' reference, for affordable housing, it usually refinances and, and gets to renovate on 15 to 20 year timelines. So that's a great time uh, in that building life cycle to leverage whatever usual renovation work that's being done to go deeper and then layer on that energy efficiency upgrade and the transition to those clean energy building systems, um, heating and cooling, and ultimately uh, domestic hot water as well. So secondly, uh, we have to think about the ongoing operating costs that might result from transitioning from gas or oil powered systems to all electric systems. So um, the, we know that the cost of a unit of energy is more expensive in electricity than in gas at this point. And so to, to, we really need to reduce, to maximize efficiency, uh, to reduce our overall energy load, right? And then we need to ensure that there's adequate financial protections in place uh, for folks who do transition to all electric systems. So that may look like a deeper discount rate for low and moderate income uh, rate payers who convert to highly efficient uh, all electric systems, uh, renewable energy, like uh, Brucey was talking about, the solarized campaigns, that's another great way to lower um, energy costs. And then we must also ensure that uh, anti-displacement -displace measures 
maybe like right to stay protections for lower income renters um, are, are in place for buildings who receive upgrades. So how do you really address um, pr the protection in this transition for all, all incomes? The third pillar of decarbonization or equitable decarbonization as we see it is really ensuring that good paying jobs uh, that are being created as a result of this big transition all across the board, right? From the solar jobs to the weatherization jobs um, and everything in between go to people who have been historically underrepresented or left out of uh, the green or the, the green building and clean energy sector. So particularly black, indigenous and people of color. Um, and then if we follow these three pillars, the upfront, the operating costs, and then the equitable um, job training and access, the benefits of decarbonization are are real and they include better climate readiness in the face of extreme temperatures and weather. Um, they result in healthier indoor air quality um, and better comfort for residents. And it's a more stable energy future for, for everyone. Next slide, please. So there are, the, the good news is there are concrete steps that individual residents such as yourselves can do to really make a meaningful difference in furthering equitable building decarbonization. So uh, as Lauren mentioned, there will be that net zero code that will be finalized by the end of this year. So municipalities can opt in to that net zero municipal code. Arlington can do that. And that's a great way to help support the construction of more high performance, low carbon new construction, specifically this passive house that we've been talking about for, for multifamily housing that's so important. Secondly, we encourage everyone to endorse the HERO campaign. So this is a proposal to double our deeds excise tax. It would still be in line with all other New England states, but what it does is it ensures an additional funding stream of a significant funding stream, about $300 million a year. And half of that would be slated to go to support affordable housing and half to climate readiness or resiliency upgrades. The third thing that uh, we're asking folks to do is to join. We have a coalition of 90 uh, organizations and strong and growing to join the Zero Carbon Renovation Fund. So this is a proposal to allocate at least 250 million of American Rescue Plan Act funding or ARPA funding to really prioritize equitable building decarbonization work. This would be um, prioritizing investments in environmental justice communities and other communities that have been dis disproportionately impacted by COVID. So uh, we've got links there so you can learn more about these and join us, reach out to us with any questions. But those are just some of the steps um, that, that we recommend um, you can take to, to help in this equitable housing transition. And so I think that's the end for us and I'll turn it over to Zoe and Michelle. Thank you. Thanks, Emily and Lauren. Um, so again, um, thanks everybody um, and Brucey for, for the introduction, but um, I'm Zoe Weinrobe. I'm the Director of Real Estate at Two Life Communities where, um, actually if you can go to the next slide, um, a nonprofit affordable senior housing developer based in Brighton. We are nearly 60 years young um, at Two Life. And um, I think one of the things that differentiates Two Life from many affordable housing developers is that we are the developer, owner, property manager, service provider. So I think we take a much longer view of our properties and have a different relationship with our properties than many developers um, because we're working with our residents every day. We're maintaining our buildings. You know, uh, Emily said um, a lot of developers look to refinance or redevelop their uh, properties every 15 years. We're trying to look at our buildings as uh, when we do new projects or renovations, it's a 30 to 40 year life cycle cost of what we're doing. So we're really willing to put um, the extra sort of time and money and effort in um, at the forefront, knowing it's going to save us money over time. So um, we've got about 1,400 apartments throughout Greater Boston. We've actually, in addition to that, we've got 200 or so apartments currently under construction and about 600 apartments um, in active pre-development. And almost all of our pre-development projects are, are, are um, on track to be passive house certified. So we are all in on, on passive house um, going forward. And um, I would say, let's move on to the next slide. 
So I think a big a big focus of Two Life um, is we actually really look at our housing as a way to support our mission. And our mission is to give older adults a life of connection and and purpose in a supportive environment. And, and really the housing is a vehicle to support that mission. Um, you know, loneliness and isolation is more detrimental to people's health um, than, and then smoking or heart disease. So, I mean, it's all our buildings and our, and our sort of our projects are all about getting folks out of their apartments or out of their small isolated houses and coming to live with us in community where we can, you know, provide amazing programs and services and support and give people a much, you know, a robust, sort of uh, a quality of life. We can go on to the next. And we do that through a really sort of innovative property um, management operating model. We um, do, uh, you know, we, because we are the operating, you know, property managers, maintenance, resident services, we have a whole host of services we're providing for, for our residents. Um, programming that meets people's cultural needs, staff that meet the language needs of our, of our residents. Um, 24/7 on-site emergency response through live-in resident managers, and um, and resident service coordinators at a at a ratio of about 75 um, uh, apartments or housing um, units to uh, one resident service coordinator, who are really the sort of the linchpin of our ability to connect our residents to all the programs and services that they're eligible for, and to help design amazing programs in our buildings. So the next. So. Um, at Two Life, when we look at new at new projects or when we're thinking about building new buildings, really we start with who are we trying to serve in this community, and and what's the sort of the overall goal of the project? Are we what's the need that is in that community um, in terms of you know types of housing, you know affordability levels, and then um, and then we, of course we then go and look at location. We want to be you know close to other. We want to be close to retail. We want to be close to having people be able to walk out their door and you know get services or or restaurants or food um, right right outside their right outside their apartment. You know we want to be close to transportation. That's good for our residents. That's good for our staff, visitors. You know and and the environment. And we all and and we're often about scale. I mean to be able to provide the services that we want to provide in our buildings, we can't do that in small twenty or thirty apartment buildings. We're looking really at um, at, at at trying to build buildings. You know between seventy five and hundred apartments per building to really, uh, the, the more unit apartments we can build in a building, the more services we can provide. And that's really the, the number one goal. And then obviously cost, <laughs> you know, doing affordable housing development in greater Boston is, is, is a challenge in any day and, and, and in high cost communities like Arlington, like Newton, Brookline, Boston, it's all about, sometimes it, you know, it's really to come down to the numbers. We can go to the next. So um, one thing that we've been doing at the same time as looking at new projects and new and new communities, we also have been really focusing over the last um, number of years on renovating our existing buildings. We work a lot with New Ecology and helping to really um, look at not we're not just looking at doing renovations of kitchens and bathrooms and and we do what, which we always do and a lot of accessibility upgrades to make sure our our apartments are are designed to help meet the residents' needs as they age. Um, but we also are hyper focused on sustainability. Um, we uh, always include utilities in rent at Two Life, and so we really just don't want our residents having to make decisions about whether or not to have heat or food or medicine. And so, um, so we are we are often you know focused on on sustainability measures. We do a lot of work in our existing buildings when we renovate on improving the heating and cooling. We um, historically did not provide air conditioning, so as we've renovated buildings, we've We've put in central air conditioning almost everywhere, um, focusing on the envelope and um, and you know the, the the usual sort of low hanging fruit of high efficiency appliances and fixtures and low flow low, low flow fixtures. Um, and as you can see in our Golda Meyer House uh, renovation that we did a number of years ago, um, resulted in pretty significant decrease in, in pounds of CO two. Um, so we can go on to the next. So one other project I thought would be um, nice to highlight is a, our Brown Family House project in Brookline. It's actually right in the heart of Coolidge Corner in, um, on Harvard Street, connected to Congregation Kehillath Israel. We actually have a, um, a bridge connecting the building to, um, to KI, and we were actually able to do the project in such an amazing location um, because we have a long-term ground 
ground lease with KI and, um, and an amazing partnership there. Um, this building was built to green communities, enterprise green communities um, certification standards and, and, and did meet, become certified car free for residents made the project happen and um, which was not necessarily um, an easy thing to get through when we were doing the comprehensive permit a number of years ago, but we felt really strongly and, and, and got a lot of support from folks in, in the town to support a car free building for our residents. Um, we also uh, went after, you know, we are very opportunistic when it comes to green opportunities, including at the time we were building this, there was a really amazing incentive program um, for so to provide almost 100% of the cost or a really significant amount of the cost for a solar thermal hot water system that is has really we we pay almost nothing it's our only gas um, in this building it's the only natural gas fired um, uh, source of uh, energy in the building and the domestic hot water and and the solar thermal hot water system has really made our gas bills in that building almost a minimal and then sort of again you know focusing on the envelope high efficiency heating and cooling and, and appliances we can go to the next, we've got some pretty pictures of Brown, which we're thrilled. This building came online actually during COVID um, in the spring of 2020. So lease up and, uh, with a bit of a challenge at, at that time, but we're really proud of the building it, it became. So it's 62 units, not 100% affordable. We have many tiers of affordability in this building. Apartments with um, project-based vouchers serving extremely low-income people, making you know ten to fifteen thousand dollars a year, up to some unrestricted market-rate apartments as well. So you can see, um, so the Harvard Street view on the top left, um, our, a beautiful courtyard we have, um, and that's uh, the KI Sanctuary Building on on the top right, and then some um, some views of our ground floor Village Center programming. Um, our buildings are not what you would say is like efficient in terms of a uh, rentable square footage to the overall size of the building um, because we really focus on having these amazing ground floor, what we call village center program spaces to get residents out of their apartment and come um, downstairs and participate in all of our programs and services. We can go to the next. So another really exciting project for us is under construction right now in Brighton on Chestnut Hill Ave, 142 apartments, 100% affordable, um, below 60% of area median income, which right now for a one person household, I think is about um, 45 or $50,000 a year. And um, it's a partnership with the Boston Housing Authority. And it's actually a redevelopment of an existing Boston Housing Authority property um, where a 64, 60, that there were 64 apartments there originally. So we're um, more than doubling the amount of affordable housing on the site um, at, with 142 apartments. There's also an amazing partnership with um, uh, Pace Center, which is a program for all inclusive care for the elderly, um, providing um, wraparound services. It's a healthcare um, uh, insurance product and um, provider for low, um, low income elderly uh, folks who are, um, who are nursing home eligible. And so it's, it's really a great partnership. Also, this will be our first uh, passive house building and um, we'll have an extensive solar PV system and then you know the usual sort of uh, suite of, uh, of green features, but um, a really beautiful, exciting building. And we've got some pretty pictures of that on the next slide. Um, so you can see our, our main entrance on the top left, uh, an amazing actually intergenerational playground that we're building um, on the top right. Um, of just a sort of a, a sample view of what the what the ground floor lobby is going to look like, and on the bottom right, on the you'll see um, is actually it's under construction right now. So they were just pouring this lab last week and putting up steel. So we're really excited with the progress. So this will be coming online in the summer of 2023. So next slide. So I think I just wanted to end with um, you know we are are. We really are, um, I think, so in line with uh, uh, the two life sort of development philosophy with, with um, what Talia and Jenny were talking about with the different programs going on in, in the town. We're, you know, we believe in high density affordable housing. We think that it's green, you know, building in great locations near transit, near services, near programs is, is, is great for our residents and it, and it reduces the overall <clears throat> energy usage of the residents. Big building, these bigger these bigger buildings use less energy. They're cheaper to build and um, and 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 provide um, housing where, where people don't need to use their cars and um, and use a lot less energy in operation. And and it allows um, our our residents to age in community with dignity and 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 creates a real um, amazing community ability to create these amazing communities. 
And um, and I think one one side benefit we talk about um, a lot is by by um, allowing older adults to come live with us in these these larger buildings, it frees up the 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 existing housing stock um, to young families. You know, a lot of older adults are in in much larger houses uh, right now, and so being able to come and downsize into our buildings really will free up um, free up housing stock for, for for others. So I think I would leave it at that. I think. One more slide. Thank you. And then I'm passing it on to Michelle. Awesome. Thank you, Zoe. That was great. Thank you, Emily and Lauren um, and the whole Arlington team. Next slide. So I'm Michelle. I'm with Icon Architecture. I've been there 20 years now. Um, we are a women-owned um, business based in Boston and really focused on sustainable communities at all scales. Um, next slide. We have a number of practice areas. Um, I'm going to be talking tonight about residential because that's what we're talking about and that's really where my, my work is. Um, but we also do a lot of institutional work with both colleges and universities, as well as with city, the city and the state um, assets. And more and more in that middle wedge, we're working with existing buildings in either capacity. It could be housing, it could be something else, but our existing buildings are here to stay. And you're gonna hear that theme in my presentation as well. Next. Um, one of the reasons I'm so excited to be in the field that we're in is that climate change is real and it's important and we need to deal with it. And our industry has a real capacity to do that. So um, the future is undetermined. We really need to keep, we really need to stop saying that. We really actually need to just dial in what we're going to be doing so that the future is determined. But for the moment, it's still undetermined and it depends a lot on what we do. Next slide. Um, and it turns out that buildings are a really, really, really important piece of the equation. Um, globally, they represent about 40% of the overall energy use. Um, in this country, they're closer to 50%. And in Massachusetts, depending on how it's all broken out, it's, it's in the 40 to 50% range as well. Um, so it's a huge opportunity, which is the way I need to think about things. Um, and it's great to have the ability to really dive in deep every day and think about how we can do that. Next. I definitely wanna echo the comments about existing buildings here in the bottom two quadrants. Uh, of rectangles is what exists now. And that's mostly not going anywhere. And it's going to need ongoing capital improvements to set us up for the next hundred years of those buildings. Um, what we do with new construction is critically important. We should do it right from the get-go and we know how, and that's a little bit what I'm gonna talk about. But what we do with our existing buildings is, is really the next frontier and it's where we need to put our energy now that we know how to do the new stuff right. Um, the passive house standard's been referenced a few times. I just wanna dig into it a little bit because I do think it's important for folks to understand what makes for a low energy building. So we used to build buildings that had no insulation I know the home I'm sitting in now was that way before we used the Mass Save program. Thank you very much to put some insulation in our house. Um, and we wore sweaters and they were drafty and we had a single point source of heat, a fireplace typically. Um, then we got a bunch of technology and we got really excited and I, um, I always credit the architects who did these diagrams. This is not us, but it's fabulous. And this is kind of the world we're living in now. Like the, Things are really complicated. They don't always work together. They don't always operate um, clearly. People don't know how to maintain them. And really it's a lot of technology trying to do the work that the building could do on its own if we just designed it right. So on the right is a super insulated thermal envelope 
It's a building that's going to maintain temperature inside, no matter what's going on outside by design. We can do this. And then we can have really tiny, small systems that are very right sized, that are much more easy to operate and understand. And they are not fighting with one another. Next. When we do that, when we reduce the operational energy, Lauren's point earlier, we've been talking a lot about that operational energy, the, build, the energy the building uses during its lifetime, it's EUI, energy use intensity, and we eliminate fossil fuels, that then we have an all electric building and we can add renewable energy that's not over the top, just right sized for the building and ultimately potentially achieve net zero. It's not as simple as that because different building sizes lend themselves better than others. But if you don't first reduce that operational energy use, your utility bills every month, you can't get there effectively. Next. So we did have, uh, we, we do have three now passive house Almost the third is not quite certified yet, actually. Harbor Village almost it's got its PV array is getting installed this month, as I understand it. But we've got two certified buildings, a third hopefully to be certified, and many, many more in construction um, and in design. And as has been said, I think the the data is there, the building science is there, the utility information is there, that this is a great choice for having a low energy building. Um, from which you can get to a healthy building and potentially an all electric building. So we're excited about um, the way things are moving, particularly in the multifamily world. Next. I love to show this graph. Um, this is actually not Massachusetts. This is New York City having taken stock. You can see it's a few years ago now. Um, but of their existing building portfolios and analyzing how much energy each of them uses. And then on the, the, the red lines across the bottom there are identifying our three first passive house buildings and how much energy they're using relative to, um, to all of those. And I think the key here is to look at the residential, right? 132 versus way down in the, in the 20s for energy use intensity. And that's what we're going for. And that's what we can do in new construction if we just plan it right and think through it in the right order. Next. Um, I do, I wanna touch briefly on intention, which Lauren and um, Emily definitely hit, but I just wanna reiterate how important that is. And then I wanna talk about density. Next. So um, in 2015, the Mass Building Code acknowledged Passive House as an alternative compliance path, which is big, a big deal because it means that they're seeing the building science and they're seeing that um, if you do that, we trust you and, and you don't have to jump through hoops to show us else, elsewise how you're meeting the, the code. Um, there have been a lot of incentives since then and Lauren touched on a bunch of them. So I'm not going to dwell, but I can't emphasize enough what a sea change it's been over the last few years since the mass save incentives kicked off in particular, um, catapulted by Mass CEC, which is a phenomenal organization. Um, and then ultimately on the affordable side, the Department of Housing and Community Development, which, which is a significant uh, factor in funding a lot of this multifamily affordable housing in the state. And they have um, their own program to evaluate the competitiveness of projects. And they used the data that they had achieved or received from these other you know, programs and the information that had been gathered and ultimately decided that the Passive House Standard was that important in their program that it would sort of get that many more points in, in terms of um, recognizing teams. And now we've got the net zero stretch code underway. But the community advocacy piece is also huge because there are a lot of towns that don't necessarily have something baked in 
to their codes, but they do have a group, an advocacy group that has made it loud and clear that they're not gonna allow permitting of projects that are really not doing the right thing. So we're, this has been fundamental to the, the change that we've seen in the last few years. And I, it's amazing to hear Zoe that like all of your projects going forward and pass fast to new, like, of course it should be, right? Next. And I should reiterate that New Ecology has been on a bunch of our projects too. So we, we highly value their wisdom and their insight and their support along the way. Now I wanna to turn to density. Um, and as an architect, um, I, I see it so clearly in the way buildings hit the page, the way they hit the ground, uh, ultimately what's left over. So of course you can get more homes. And that is, we, we have a housing crisis. So we need, we need more homes. Those homes are in a smaller footprint and they leave a lot more open space on the land. And many of our communities are desperate for more open space. So continuing to do what we've been doing um, doesn't allow for that. When we do that, we also, we don't just use less land, but we use less materials because we are, we have a smaller building overall. And that is getting right back to Lauren's point about our carbon footprint. It's not just how it hits the ground and how many resources we're using in the, on the land. It's also how big is the building? How, how much wood and steel and concrete, et cetera, does it take? How much does it take to clad that building and create uh, you know, your finished product? Um, all of that makes it more cost-effective, which Zoe was definitely talking about. And all of that makes it more energy efficient but not just more energy efficient, actually easier to be a high performance building that then can be all electric and we can get off of fossil fuels. Um, and finally, all of that leaves more opportunity within the scope of the project to do things that are special relative to whatever population you're serving. Next. So I wanna talk about two projects. This is a new construction project, which uh, was referenced earlier. Um, this is actually our second passive house project in the state, but our first all affordable. And it's 98 units uh, on Concord Ave in Cambridge, family housing. Um, lots of great accolades, a phenomenal uh, owner, uh, homeowners rehab in, at, based out of Cambridge. But what is so important about it is that it is immediately across the street from Fresh Pond, an amazing open space and an amazing connector to bike paths. There's bus transit, there's the T within a mile, there's existing infrastructure in the street that we didn't have to bring to some new location because it didn't exist before. And so it's really, it's really leveraging a whole lot in order to make the most of this site. And all of that said, when you look at this building, um, everything you're seeing practically is units in terms of the windows, but on the top floor, because we were able to be so efficient and because we, it's important, all these projects, frankly, it's really important to have program space that brings the community together we were able to do things that you might never have imagined. Next slide. Like on the bottom left, create a really grand, spacious, warm lobby um, connected to management offices, connected to a community, uh, a, a conference space that can be used by folks in the building as well as the staff. Um, to on the top, create a whole series of lounge spaces, including a roof deck where they can have plantings and gardening classes, including a, a lovely kitchen where they can learn to cook and how to make healthier choices and including kind of flex lounge space on the top right, complete with quiet rooms where folks can study when you're Schooling from home, for example, and need just a little bit of space, or you're taking a work interview and you need a little bit of space. Um, 
So just really thinking broadly about what it means to live 24 seven. And of course the last few years have really changed our perspective about that. And having the ability to offer these kinds of spaces within the community is so important. Next. Excuse me just a moment. Um, Michelle, this is an absolutely fabulous presentation. And I want yeah. to hear every syllable but uh -huh. I'm looking at the clock and I'm wondering if we're, we're ready to wrap up shortly. Totally, I'm just about done. I just Excellent. got a few more. Thank you so Thanks, much. Brucey. Yep. So I wanna go back to existing buildings because there's a quite well-known phrase in the world of architects anyway, that the most sustainable building is the one that is already built. And that gets back to Lauren's point. Next. And so while I think it's, pretty straightforward these days to do this in new construction across the board. Um, existing buildings matter. And we're now really thinking about how the when capital improvements are needed, when you need to think comprehensively about upgrades, what order to do it in, how to do it in a way that's really maximizing the building for the next 50 to 100 years before you actually have the chance to do it again. Um, and so this project is on target to be Passive House certified as well, but it is an existing building that's occupied. So it's achievable. Um, it's kind of the next generation. Next. And I just wanted to close with some slides because those were two very big buildings and we are talking about Arlington and Arlington has some big buildings for sure, but it's not, that's not like everywhere. I wanted to just share a few images of what density can look like. Every one of these projects is affordable, um, hundreds of units in many cases. Uh, this is in Rhode Island, uh, uh, sorry, in Connecticut, Quinnipiac Terrace, next. This is in Rhode Island, and this was a five um, part master plan that was built out over 10 years, next. This is in Chelsea uh, and also was a many phased project. Um, next, this is in um, Mattapan. Next, and this is in East Boston. And so I just wanna say density doesn't have to be a high rise or even a mid rise. It depends on where you're located, but townhouses versus single family homes, it's a, it's a, it's a hundred percent difference in terms of the way we put things together and the space that's available. And it could still feel charming and appropriate to the character of the community. And that's it. Oh, thank you so much. What a wonderful set of presentations. I want to have you all back uh, to talk at greater length. So I think we've heard about the potential for working with our existing building stock, creating some new buildings as space and opportunity present, somewhat limited in Arlington, but nonetheless, and building community. Also ensuring that residents who have lived in Arlington for many, many decades, perhaps their entire lives, can, if not age in their own homes, at least age in their own communities. And for those of us who have moved parents between, from one state to another or from one part of a state to another, that is a painful shift to be able to stay in the community that has been your home is enormously valuable. And while we do often think, oh, I wanna stay in my house forever, the time comes when it gets to be too hard and it gets to be too lonely. So it is it's very interesting to think about how the models that you have talked about and, and illustrated could be incorporated here in Arlington. Um, and I wonder if um, you could talk a little bit about the kinds of resources that might be available to help Arlington accomplish this. And I open that to anyone who wants to jump in and field that question. I 
I guess as a developer in the in the in the panel, I'm 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 happy to take a stab at that. But others, please feel free um, to jump in. I think um, when we when we as True Life are looking at at locations, I mean, obviously, communities like Arlington are amazing. You know, in, in terms of you know the variety of um, of resources available, its proximity. You know, to sort of you know main centers and transit and and other um and other great things i think what what for 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 us it's all you know it's 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 what we talked about what i talked about is having a, a large enough size of of property that we can find that we can afford and 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 that's you know often what it comes down to i mean our our uh our our the brookline project that i that i mentioned we were able to to build in coolidge corner because we had an amazing program partner with um uh with a religious synagogue you know if, if that had gone out on the open market we could have never afforded to buy you know just competing with private developers you know to build affordable housing um but that's a about that was a small site that site was less than 20,000 square feet, um, which is, you know, less than a half an acre. And, and um, we were able to put 62 apartments on that site. It was a six story building with no resident parking though. Um, so, and, you know, and we, 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 we did that project um, as a comprehensive permit, you know, Brookline at the time was under 10%. I think it's actually close to being at 10% now. Um, but it was a, a town supported project with um, being a hundred percent affordable. And so we did get a lot of support from, from folks at Town Hall um, supporting this 100% affordable and, and this under 100% affordable community. I should say the town also put significant resources into that project through their affordable housing trust and um, and their use of, of home funds that they received, you know, from the House Department of Housing and Urban Development. Um, and I think the town contributed over $4 million to that project to make that project happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I could totally add to that. So the Finch project in Cambridge was also highly supported by the city's CPA funds, um, which is really important. Um, and beyond that, I think it's, there are opportunities for the city to think about their zoning. This is to think about their, you know, their policy and how there are requirements on the one hand, but there's also incentives on the other hand. So one of the positions that Somerville has taken is that there's a, a bonus, a density bonus, um, if you consider, if you are gonna go passive house with multifamily, then you, you, know, you get a little bit of a bump in how many your units versus your parking, et cetera. So there are different ways to think about it. Newton is thinking, is looking at it in its own way, but every community kind of has to understand their own landscape. Unfortunately, we have a lot of communities in this, in this Commonwealth and they all operate quite differently. Um, so you got to take stock of the landscape and then figure out where the opportunities are to offer something more that's going to incense the right thing from my perspective. Thank you so much. So people will be have seen the pictures that you've shown now and, and been thinking about these um, new building technologies and wondering how does the cost stack up against conventional construction? Can you talk perhaps in terms of cost per square foot to complete either a deep energy retrofit such as you've done or a building a new um, building completely? What kinds of costs per square foot are communities going to be looking at? Lauren, you want to take that? Yeah, I can, I can start and then I'm sure you guys might have specific examples of projects to talk about. But, um, you know, this is obviously a very hot topic within the context of passive house, especially within the affordable housing community who, you know, that housing is is built with subsidy uh, and those subsidies are limited. And so it is potentially one of the more cost constrained types of development that's happening. And so so incremental costs associated with high performance housing has obviously been a major concern. Um, 
um, we were very lucky as a state to have models to look at from the state of Pennsylvania, who implemented incentives around high performance, passive house, affordable housing, many years before Massachusetts did. And so there were a number of uh, projects that were designed and built in Pennsylvania um, that had actual cost operating um, or incremental cost information uh, to provide. And so, you know, that information was very much leveraged in the advocacy that happened at the state level here in Massachusetts to get Passive House to be included as one of the incentives in the provision of subsidy for affordable housing. Um, and I think, you know, the first round of projects, I, you know, to speak specifically about Massachusetts, the first round of projects that were part of a pilot that got some money from the Clean Energy Center to really do this for the first time here, uh, came in in the sort of one to 3% incremental cost range. Um, with, with many projects, when you actually factor in incentives, um, you know, for example, the Finch Cambridge project coming in at less than 1% when you factored in incentives from the utilities. And so, so I think that's a, a super compelling argument around that this work can be done at the scale of housing very affordably. Um, and you get such significant benefits, as Michelle was pointing out, in terms of the overarching uh, energy benefits and operating cost benefits over the life of the building. Yeah, I would add to that and say, that's new construction, and I honestly think we're we're close to cost parity. If you just if you've just got you know if if your value structure is established and passive house is part of it, you're going to make it work. We're gonna we're gonna figure that out. Um, renovation and deep energy retrofits is definitely a different ball game entirely. And honestly, there's so many buildings and so many types of buildings, each quite unique, frankly. Um, that I think the landscape we're in right now is trying to figure out what are some of those fundamental ty typologies. You know, the large double oak corridor, tall building like I showed that we're renovating from the outside, the triple decker. You know, there there are typologies, but even then, it's not it's not a one size fits all mindset. So deep energy retrofits are expensive, and this is I think I hope where mass save is is trying to move um, is to help figure out the next landscape, which is now we've got this on the new side. How do we, how do we help incent and subsidize a little bit on the existing side so that we can get our wings? Mm -hmm. Emily, maybe it makes sense to talk about the climate ready housing program. I think that's a, a great program that's trying to incentivize and, and really scale up the work that's happening in the existing building world. Yeah. So, so yeah, the climate ready housing program that we, we do have the state last year in the governor's economic development bond bill did allocate 10, $10 million over five years. So um, small change in, in affordable housing, um, you know, world, but that will provide gap funding for affordable housing to do these deep, what we're calling deep energy retrofits or building really intense building decarbonization. And so the first round of folks are now into that. We're hoping, as I mentioned before, that zero carbon renovation fund, this ask for like two, at least 250 million is now um, in front of the, the legislature like to, to, for consideration. So, but in the meantime, we, we do have this pilot program where we'll be able to have at least two to three projects per year, really try this, see what works. Um, and it's really following on the heels of New York's retrofit uh, New York program, which is um, they they provide forty thousand dollars per unit to do um, building decarbonization. So wow, we want to get didn't know that that's exciting they do stuff. they do yeah. So we we want to get to that point, and we and then of course we 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 want to make it more cost effective. You know, there's um, the, the industry is working with manufacturers to, to compress costs, get, um, like Michelle was saying, get those typologies, those solutions for different building typologies a little more replicable. So we're, we're as Michelle said, we're, we're almost there. We're there for Passive House or close to the, for, for new construction. And then this next nut to crack is existing buildings, deep, deep retrofits. So 
Yeah. I would add to that just in terms of the smaller residential scale that the Clean Energy Center currently has what they call the triple decker affordable pilot program in play, where they're working to develop um, cost effective, scalable retrofits that can be made uh, on occupied triple deckers. You know, obviously the triple decker is a very ubiquitous housing type here in Massachusetts. And um, so I expect a lot of really good technical and financial information to come out of those projects as well that can be deployed across the smaller scale housing. That sounds like it will be of particular interest in Arlington. Thank you so much. I'd like to turn to Steve, who's going to pick up some questions from our listeners, our audience this evening. Uh, thank you, Brucey. I'll start with, um, although the it was the, when it was asked, it was specific to Arlington. I'll make it a little more general. Um, what resources are available to ensure that low and moderate income households have access to things like mass save programs? A really good question. Um, theoretically, they have access, but only as as well as they're connected to the opportunities. I think what I can reference there, and, and Emily, you might have more feedback on this, but um, in terms of the new three-year plan that was recently implemented for the utilities, which is essentially the guide the utilities have to use as they develop and implement their incentive programs, um, there was a really strong focus on making sure that there's sufficient outreach uh, and engagement with low and moderate income communities across the state, um, you know, very much in line with sort of the environmental justice and equity lens that they try to bring to the conversation. And so I know that the Mass Safe program is really much more actively looking to engage with municipalities to achieve that goal um, and also other community-based organizations and institutions. And so really thinking strategically about how they do outreach to make sure that they're targeting low and moderate income individuals for their programs and being able to deploy those programs that way. Um, the other really important thing to know is that there are additional resources for low and moderate income individuals. So the standard mass safe programs apply across the marketplace, but there are very specific programs that the weatherization uh, cap agencies administer where additional incentives are brought to bear to pry and reduce energy and increase weatherization in affordable housing. Um, so making sure we're connecting individuals and organizations that serve individuals that are low income with those programs that have even more incentives becomes very important. All right, may um, I jump in? If I could just oh. add a little bit to that answer. Um, so uh, Arlington actually has access to an organization called CAPIC, which is one of those agencies that Lauren was just referencing. Um, they provide weatherization services to residents in Arlington who are elig income eligible um, and can access mass save programs as well as many other weatherization opportunities. Um, they're based in Chelsea and also have an office in Cambridge and um, are able to serve people in Arlington. The information about that program is actually on the Department of Planning and Community Development webpage. So if anybody would like access to that information, I would encourage you to check it out. Um, in that question, there was also another, uh, or there were, there, were, there were a couple of questions in there. Steve, if it's okay for me to take on. Oh, uh, oh yeah, the, uh, so the what specific plans does Arlington have to increase the number of affordable housing units in Arlington? Yeah, I was going to start general and then go specific, but go, Please, please proceed. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, the first thing I would just wanted to say is actually the person we have um, 6.54% of uh, affordable housing in Arlington. That is actually our percentage now. Um, we've increased uh, the number of affordable housing units in the community by 185 um, in the past six years. Um, so we have 1,301 affordable housing units that are on technically listed on our subsidized housing inventory, but um, of course, there are plans in, in place um, through the housing production plan, which was recently adopted by the Arlington Redevelopment Board and the Select Board, and is awaiting approval by the Department of Housing and Community Development. And the types of things that we're working on related to affordable housing creation is with uh, providers of affordable housing already in Arlington. Um, that includes the Housing Corporation of Arlington, and also working in concert with the Arlington Housing Authority. When there are possibilities to work together, 
we, um, you know, and as many of the examples that you heard and in the answers that have been provided, we try to provide uh, any subsidies or funds that we can, that we have available to the town, including community development block grant, home, community preservation act funding, and eventually once the housing trust has funds in it, those funds as available uh, to, are available also to affordable housing creation. So there are a lot of activities um, that have already happened. And then there's of course much more to do, which is outlined in that plan. Thank you. Okay, Bruce, you may I go for another one or two? All right, good. So one of, so this might be, this next one might be for a combination of Michelle and or Bruzy. Um, so a few of the attendees have noticed that the, uh, some of the, the picture we were, some of the buildings that we've seen are larger apartment buildings. Um, we've talked to um, a few of the, Michelle and I think maybe Zoe have talked about how um, density is plays an important role in building at the scale that lets them meet their mission and or lets the you know allows missions to be met and also to um, you know provide um, you know reduce footprints and that sort of thing. Now, for a community that ha is predominantly single and two family homes, um, and you know it's generally a, a much smaller scale. What sort of considerations um, or are there, what are the pros and cons of the, you know, trying to build larger buildings versus smaller? And, you know, what are some of the th things that a community should sort of weigh pros and cons in terms of trying to, you know, think that through? I could jump in quickly. With this, the comment that while we do have a high percentage of single and, and two family housing, we also have a number of apartment buildings. Um, and some of them are getting to be along in years. And at some point they are going to need major capital infusions to um, upgrade them. And what is the potential for an owner of one of those buildings, for example, to collaborate with you on putting this kind of a program into effect in their building? Is there a way to collaborate for, a, there was a discussion of um, multiple pri tier pricing, uh, for example, and it doesn't, and different um, age groups being in involved. So I wonder how we can foster something in the community. Have you ever done a, a collaboration with a, an apartment building owner or do you always start with straight possession of the building and that's it? Um, so as the architect, I'm never in possession of the building. Uh, <laughs> I'll just start there. These are never my buildings. Um, we're hired by an owner who, if they have an existing building, wants to understand what they should and can do with the building um, and usually gets a capital needs assessment if it's a larger building in particular to, uh, to really think through the whole picture. And then they bring on a design team to help them understand how to upgrade it for the 21st century. Um, if it's, it, otherwise, it's an owner coming to us with a site, an opportunity um, to potentially demolish a building. R rarely are we just coming with open sites in, you know, in this context, um, but a building that maybe wasn't making best use of the land and maybe more, more, there's much more opportunity there to do something that enlivens, enlivens the street front, you know, and also can add housing above. And you know, Arlington is not unusual in the Commonwealth and it's not unusual in the country. There are corridors, there are, you know, down to, there's the city center elements where more density is perfectly um, plausible. In some cases it already exists. Maybe, maybe what's there isn't what people would have liked. And so there's a little bit of that going on, uh, uh, kind of the random tall building that feels really out of character with what's going on. But I will just say, for example, that Mass Ave is an exceptionally wide street. 
and it is largely commercial on the ground floor. And I see in my mind as an urban planner, no reason that we couldn't think about Mass Ave with more vibrance, with more density, still meeting all the commercial needs that are there, but adding, adding to the infrastructure to the, that exists, giving people a direct act, act, uh, you know, access to bus transit close to the T. Um, so there are corridors, it, it's not everywhere. You don't just insert a, a, a tall building into the middle of a neighborhood. Um, it's, it's strategic. It's really thinking about what are your major, you know, where, where does density matter? And that's the work of the city to, to figure that out. And I'm sure that Jenny would have some thoughts on that. I wasn't unmuting. I, I, I do, but I, I wonder, we, we have a lot of questions awaiting. So I think we might want to move, move to some other questions. Thank you though. Yes. Uh, so let me see. So here, next one is, have any of your new passive house builds used CLT? And can you speak to the depth of knowledge in builders, design planners to use or choose mass timber? Yeah, so none of mine yet. We are, we have looked at it a few times now. There is one Passive House CLT building that I believe is almost complete, if not complete. Do you know about that one, Lauren? Actually, if, if I could jump in for a second, what is CLT? Is I would have yeah. thought, thought Community Land Trust. No, cross laminated timber. So these are tall wood buildings. These are buildings, so in Massachusetts, wood can only go so high unless you're using this special type of wood. Um, but wood is way better from an embodied carbon perspective than concrete and steel, which is often the base of our wood construction. Um, so it's totally happening. I haven't done it yet. I think it's coming. I think it's real. And they've been doing it in Canada for 20 years. They've been doing it in Europe for the same. So our code was a little late to catch up and we've been a little late to kind of test it, but it's coming. I think the place where we see cross laminated timber having some uptake right now are really in the taller buildings. Um, you know, the buildings where you would otherwise be building with concrete and steel. Um, that's where we're seeing, you know, cost competitiveness, essentially, and, a, and an alternative that can work from a financial perspective and achieve, you know, just as good structural implications, as well as these really reduced embodied carbon impacts. Um, so, so again, in terms of applicability, um, you know, you're probably not seeing a ton of those, you know, seven, eight, ten-story buildings uh, in your community. Um, but we do, we are starting to see some of them. Michelle, I think the the passive house project that you're referencing, that's a that's a Boston-based project, I believe, exactly. seven stories. Yep. Um, so that's really where we're starting to see traction of of this construction methodology. Because if you're comparing cross-laminated timber to traditional sort of stick frame wood construction which you can do for lower rise buildings, it's still a lot less expensive to use stick build construction. But again, comparing it to these taller types of structural systems, um, it starts to have some advantages. So I noticed that there's a question about where these questions are coming from one of our audience members. And of course, they're being typed into the Q&A. Um, and there's another audience member who wanted to know how to ask a question. Again, type it into the Q&A. Um, Steve, do you have another one ready to go? Uh, yes. So this is about, oh, let me just scroll up to see it. Uh, it involves deep energy retrofits of existing buildings. So uh, one of the participants has a 1934 home and was able to reduce their fossil fuel use by 75% um, by taking advantage of a state pilot program called the MVP program. And uh, do we know if there are more programs that are coming online to help owners, you know, to help them improve the efficiency of their homes beyond the limitations of mass save? Yeah, and actually, there was a, um, a 
had mentioned the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center a few times in, in the course of this panel. Um, you know, the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center actually just finished a pilot program where they were working with homeowners, so smaller scale residential homeowners, uh, to do deep energy retrofit decarbonization of their buildings, and that was a successful pilot. I know that they're starting to engage right now in developing sort of the next iteration of that with the goal of trying to create some scale and efficiency around it so that it could potentially potentially ultimately be adopted by the mass safe program. Um, and so I think that we're, we are going to see more and more of that with more and more focus on uh, the electrification side of things as well, really converting homes from their fossil fuel based heating systems to electrified heat pump type efficient heating systems, but doing that in a very conscious way and pairing it with envelope improvements, heating energy load reduction measures. Okay, may, may I ask another? All right, so what are some of the challenges and benefits with respect to achieving net zero when building taller structures, or in this case, it might be more appropriate to ask when retrofitting taller structures, uh, like the um, Housing Authority's Winslow Towers building in Arlington Center? So the, just yeah. for, yeah, so this is a uh, maybe 12-ish story, building that was um, it's senior housing. It was built in the early 70s um, and it's yeah right in Arlington Center. <laughs> yeah, so that's pretty comparable to the retro re renovation, occupied rehab, reno passive house level renovation we're doing um, in terms of scale. Um, it's, again, there's no one size fits all. Um, and so we do have to look at them each kind of independently. But I do, um, I think the commonality is, so net zero is a term that uh, I love and also am frustrated by because I think people target it without a, a recognition of what it really means. Net zero means, in my mind anyway, and we can all quibble about it, but that you're using a certain amount of energy to operate your building on site, and you're also producing that same energy on site to offset that use, and then you get to zero. So you're using energy, of course, but you're able to capture energy, usually from the sun. Um, net zero is harder and harder, the bigger and denser your building gets. But that doesn't mean that the bigger, denser building is, is a is a bad choice. So what it what it really means is, in my view, when we start to, oh, in the future, I hope that we will start to look at net zero a little bit more broadly and comprehensively and acknowledge that there are places in our communities where it's pretty easy and awesome to put up a put up the right infrastructure and capture renewable energy and offset broadly because my Finch building, for example, which is, we couldn't have made it a lot more low energy, but it, the PV array on the roof only offsets about 20% of the energy that the building is using. And that's not to say that it's a bad building. It's not net zero, but it can't get there because it's just got so much going on. Our single family homes, should really largely be able to get there. And even there's sort of a, an order of magnitude, you know, three, four stories, a certain scale, you have enough roof space, you can offset the load. So I love net zero. It's a great goal. Um, bigger, denser buildings are not able to get there on site uh, without an array that's not on the building, which is pretty challenging in an urban context. Um, so I don't want to conflate. It's got to be low energy first. Definitely add that renewable energy as best you can. And then we've got to understand what's the delta because the delta is real. Well, thank you so much. We have reached, I'm afraid, the end of our time for questions. I'd like to turn it back to Jenny Rate and Talia Fox to wrap up the evening.
So thanks everyone for being here tonight and we thank you for your patience as we tried to get to as many questions as possible in the limited time. I'm gonna share my screen uh, with a link where you will be able to find the recording and slides from the uh, presentation tonight. So I'll do that right now. And we're just grateful for your participation. Thank you so much to all the panelists. Um, thank you to Steve and Brucey and Jenny. And we, we uh, are excited to continue this conversation it's been a great opportunity to learn. So thanks very much and have a great night. Thanks everyone for taking the time.